situation. Uh, uh, I have the impression that resilience is the norm and pathology is the exception. In Palestine, we don't have comprehensive epidemiological studies yet, but uh, uh, we are very few psychiatrists. Uh, we, between psychiatrists and doctors who work in psychiatry who are not yet specialized, who are 30 people. So a person like me would see at least 3% of the population. So we can make impressions and talk about these impressions. And in, in Palestine, some uh, 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 United Nations uh, reports and uh, some descriptive papers uh, show that uh, human development indicators show a, down, a downward trend in terms of economy, impoverishment, uh, uh, human rights issues. Uh, so the description in general is that of psychosocial erosion and uh, impairment in the well-being of the society rather than the population. For the sake of time, I will skip some slides. I will skip some slides. And uh, to give an idea about the, uh, the collective experience of Palestinians, I would say that the, the establishment of the State of Israel was a remarkable event uh, in the collective memory of Palestinians, which meant the Nakba for us. And we can learn something about the significance of the Nakba in how people interact in everyday activities. So if you meet a Palestinian <coughs> in Britain or in the United States, a young Palestinian, he would say that I'm from Allah, I'm from uh, Colonia, I'm from Hamas. They refer to places that are no longer on the map, places that were eradicated completely. Uh, the expulsion of two-thirds of the Palestinian of the uh, of, of Palestine and uh, uh, creating subgroups of people with different uh, categories with different uh, residency papers is an, a very important element uh, in shaping the, the history of Palestinians and mindset of Palestinians. Puna uh, a researcher who worked uh, with refugees in different uh, places, she interviewed someone in Lebanon, a refugee in Lebanon, uh, in her 20s, and the, the refugee told her that the worst day in her life was the day of the Nakba. And this is a story that goes from father to son to grandchildren. It's transgenerational. And until today, we see some refugees who try to commemorate the event by coming close to the borders, and some get killed on this occasion. And the key became a symbol for the the occasion and the, the memory, the very keys of the homes that people left behind. And in the life of, of Palestinians, ordinary Palestinians like myself, who are born to uh, the status of occupation and have lived all through the life of the situation, we just see the land of the Palestinian land shrinking underneath, uh, underneath uh, our feet. It's getting smaller, smaller, restrictions of movement is getting more strict, and that imposes uh, huge difficulties on the well-being of people. And uh, uh, papers are interesting. So when I was in France, I had these papers. I had a residency card, uh, which was more important than the, the my travel documentary, which refers to me as a person with an undefined uh, uh, nationality. Excuse me. Things improved a little bit later, and I became a Jordan. <laughs> uh, thinking of what happened in Gaza recently, uh, we can only uh, think of, uh, of certain patterns, not uh, single events. The escalation. Now we can take, uh, we can talk about every an escalation every couple of years, which is uh, it's like uh, a flare up of a chronic illness, a flare-up, like uh, someone who has uh, rheumatism and he just uh, rheumatoid arthritis and he is, has a flare-up of, uh, of that illness. Uh, a flare-up of a, si a situation uh, of chronic, uh, non-ending, relentless humiliation and oppression that attacks every aspect of Palestinian life, including the Palestinian personhood and character and the ideology of Palestinians. And every time just before these attacks take place, the propaganda machines create uh, a pretext and, pay, and pave the way for such a strike. 
and uh, diffuse uh, uh, cliché that uh, gets into people's minds like hypnosis. So the cliché that were associated with the latest, of course, these cliché are endless, but I will mention the, the ones that are fresh in mind. So Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. It defends itself against Palestinian violence. Their army is the most ethical. And when they strike, they do surgical strikes with their smart missiles. And now there's a lot of uh, bragging also about the iron, iron dome and so on. While Palestinians, they have a culture of hate and death. They are not ready for democracy. Palestinian resistance is like the Islamic State. We're not talking about the Jewish State today. The, and uh, Palestinians use their children as human sheep. In our profession, this is called projection. And we lived recently in uh, a, an atmosphere of unprecedented incitement. Uh, we can call it a little chicken. She said about uh, having to kill the women yeah. in Gaza and uh, the children. And uh, Mordechai Kedar, a professor from Maryland University, spoke about the only thing that can deter a Palestinian is to know that his sister or his wife will be raped when he throws uh, himself. So the result of that incitement was this earthquake like event. But this is not just an earthquake, because an earthquake does not aim to destruct the meaning system of a people. While the events of war are very well designed to destruct the meaning system of the Palestinian nation. Learned helplessness, leading to learned helplessness. But people are more sophisticated than animals, and they find their way around it. So, briefly, in the psychological effect of, of life for Palestinians, and here I generalize from some impressions. There is, of course, uh, a huge level of psycho psychosocial suffering, but not necessarily pathology. I don't think that uh, we have higher prevalence of pathology. And the reports from here and there about PTSD, we can take them with a grain of salt, because in PTSD, the trauma is over and we live it in our mind. While in Gaza, sonic bombs are still there and helicopters are still there. So, and the threat is very real. So the, there is traumatization, but it doesn't lead to the classical description of PTSD. There is also uh, structural violence and internalized oppression among Palestinians. And we know that it is uh, a well-known phenomenon that when there is vertical oppression, there is also it results in horizontal oppression between people. But there is also resilience and adversity advanced development that Palestinians relate to as sumut, the word sumut. And uh, while we saw all the killing and death in Gaza, there were also ambulance workers and doctors and journalists who worked with the maximum capacity they could have in order to save others. Some pictures to emulate some ideas. So the effect of trauma, the uh, fight, flight, or freeze, post-traumatic play, children playing with the water, grief, maybe pathological and there are some people who choose to uh, seek illegal immigration and die in the, in the water rather than tolerating the slaughter uh, under the siege. So finally, it is not Israelis who are dying in the siege. And we have our own system, which uh, we have uh, really questions about who the system is, is serving. And we cannot talk about the psychological effects in Palestine we, for Palestinians without mentioning torture. Even if the name torture uh, has changed after the Landau Committee and became moderate physical pressure, the nickname of torture. And uh, uh, the experience, according to the Palestinian Bureau of Statistics, 20% of people experience arrest at a certain point of their life. This means almost 40% of the male population. And uh, maltreatment and moderate physical pressure or torture are common, common experiences, common place when people are arrested. And recently, maybe you forgot the, the, the statement 
by Dolev, the chef of the ethical committee in the uh, Israeli Medical Association, about uh, breaking the fingers of two Palestinians is a price worth paying to extract information. But you, all, you, you probably remember the statement of the uh, Israeli Ministry of Health about force feeding recently, really. And also one of the meanings of resilience is sleeping through winter and flowering in favorable seasons. And I think this is true for Palestinians as well. So the elements of sumun and resilience for Palestinians are many. I will mention a few of them. One of them is the meaning, the, the meaning of the experience. So birth can be a painful experience, giving birth to a baby. But the meaning of it makes it a happy experience for many people. And for many Palestinians, they see the resistance and the sumur and the steadfastness in the face of the media machine and the war machine is, uh, is, the price, is a price worth paying for liberation. Uh, and this meaning, which is deeply integrated in the mindset of Palestinians, help people uh, to stand, to stay well in, in the face of, uh, of difficulties. Family structure and social cohesion are also very important, and the experience of torture and long-term imprisonment also harms the family structure because it creates of some men shadows of who they were one day, bringing them back to their homes after 15 or 20 years of imprisonment, where the young baby they left behind became the father of the family, and they are expected to smoke, cig to smoke cigarettes in front of TV. And uh, social, social cohesion is also targeted by a system of collaboration that is infiltrating some uh, Palestinian some Palestinian communities. There are other important uh, elements that, uh, like the national unity, and I can say a few things about the charter, but not for this audience, and the international solidarity and resistance versus surrender. Recently, I was consulted, I was uh, asked to provide uh, uh, psychosocial support for uh, uh, some uh, organizations from Gaza. And I met with the staff and asked about what helped them through difficult times. And here are some of the statements that came from the group. Some people said that we have a just cause. It is not, uh, it's not just our right, but our duty to defend it. Some people said, this time we were not completely helpless. We could do something. We could resist. We were not as weak as two years ago or uh, four years ago. And this means that the resistance is meaningful to the people. To be completely helpless uh, exaggerates the, the uh, impact of trauma on people. We were let, some said we were let down by government, by pop, but popular support was very meaningful. To see demonstrations in different parts of the world was meaningful to these people. And uh, some, some photos that exemplifies the uh, solidarity, the, the steadfastness and support of people. So we break the most, but they can find alternative. And older children takes care of a smaller one. And uh, I choose this photo because it reminds me of a boy from Gaza that I saw at the Maqasid hospital. Uh, the aim of transferring him to Maqasid was to try to uh, save his leg from amputation. He needed a vascular version. And uh, I was asked to see him there. And he told me that when I get better, I will, if, if, my, if my leg will be saved, I will go and participate in rebuilding the home that was demolished. Mm -hmm. And he told me that he heard that his uh, uh, classmate uh, was killed. And when he goes back to Gaza, he will go to pay condolence for the family. Mm -hmm. The tunnels. In some concentration camps, there were tunnels too, of course. And uh, uh, Brian Barber, speaks about the little help that can be provided for Palestinians to, uh, to, help, to help them uh, go on. Yeah, yeah, there were some tunnels used for resistance as well. There was resistance also in the concentration camps. And briefly about the mental health services in Palestine. Mental health services are developing quickly in Palestine 
So we have integrated mental health in primary health care. We are promoting mental health illiteracy among people. We see uh, a increased uh, accessibility to, uh, to mental health services. And we have worked a lot on flattening the hierarchy and enabling, uh, in, in a few years ago, mental health services were doctor-centered. And flattening the hierarchy enables teachers, counselors to provide services, low intensity interventions for people who need this service, not necessarily uh, psychiatry and medicalizing the, the suffering of the people. And this is useful, but this is not comprehensive because we have a special context in Palestine, and the, some of the, intervention, of the interventions should be should take into consideration this special context. So a framework that aims to reconstruct services taking into account first the social, political, historical, and cultural context is very important. And the connectedness of the person's experience and the social political structure. For example, the dramatic, the dramatic reaction of some people to uh, to life under oppression should not be only should not be interpreted only as uh, uh, through uh, uh, the intrapsychic process. Also, the oppressive environment has to play something has to play a role in that reaction. Justice and human rights are basic elements for the well-being of the community, and there is a robust uh, findings in research that shows the importance of justice for the well-being of people. Therapy is also about improving the social participation and the free agency of individuals, which is still missing in Palestine. This is some of the literature. There are some studies about the ultimatum game, where you, uh, share uh, an amount of money, you, you take $10 if you manage to share it with uh, another person. And when you propose people a 2-8 uh, division, some people refuse the deal, even if they gain $2. They refuse it because it is unfair, perceived to be unfair, and uh, neuroimaging shows that it provokes the amygdala, and it provokes parts of the limbic system that are associated with aversion reaction. So. It is innate that people <coughs> seek for justice. And it is learned that people learn to please and appease and succumb to, bo to power. And justice is not a flu term. <coughs> Maximizing welfare, promoting virtue, respecting freedom, and all are missing under occupation. And we always, I, I tend to see crises and opportunities opportunities to develop thinking about uh, the reality in which we live. Uh, and if we want to come, up, to come up with some policy recommendations, a global initiative in sol of, of solidarity that demands justice and redress for Palestinians, but also uh, that uh, enforces the state of Israel for co to comply with international law. Measures to reinforce social cohesion with Palestinians, including process reform, <coughs> transparency, promoting transparency and accountability, and also humanitarian foreign aid, which is coupled with a political support. Because humanitarian aid, when it comes with this engagement from political support, it does more harm than good. And a few words about solidarity. Solidarity is validating and acknowledging for people's experience and mirroring their emotions. Uh, so far, the, the crowds that gather in Europe uh, to express the value of Palestinians, this has been good for psychological support and for psychological ventilation for themselves, for those who do it. And we need to think about how to move that from psychological support, from humanitarian aid, to political change. This solidarity is essential, is very important in diminishing Palestinian need to fight dramatically for their liberation and paving the way for reconciliation. So Israel has tried everything to disarm Palestinians. And the uh, Palestinians started with uh, demonstrations like Land Day and then stones in the first intifada and then arms in the second intifada and then missiles. But being in solidarity can disarm in a different way. Professional solidarity. Uh, mental health workers, uh, some, some of them tend to see that uh, because of their training, they think that uh, every for a hammer, for, for a man with a hammer, everything is innate. And uh, not 
every intervention is psychotherapeutic. So here are some recommendations for interventions for people who are professionals in solidarity. First, do no harm. Participation in interrogation and advising in uh, interrogation, this is important. And if you want to provide treatment, not pathologizing, not controlling, not de depoliticizing. Uh, the interpretation of impartiality and neutrality uh, should take into consideration the aspect of the, the context in which we are working as well. Testimony and documentation. And I know some groups who are already involved in doing documentation and giving testimony, and this is very important, not only for uh, the, the direct impact of it for the individual, but also uh, for history, for uh, challenging the, uh, the powerful narrative, to question the narratives that silence the weak, and to question brainwashing. Minding the context and history, this is uh, important, especially the community approach. Designing context-specific community psychology interventions, contributing to the emancipatory process and the liberation. And the, uh, uh, some people take it to the dimension of being involved in, in boycott and divestment, and some people uh, state uh, their position against the occupation. Peacemaking and conflict conflict resolution comes later. And I hear many <coughs> psychologists who want to skip all the previous steps and be involved in peacemaking and conflict resolution. But without acknowledgement, without restitution, without uh, previous elements, I think uh, this is a shortcut that cannot make, that is not possible. Mats Gilbert, the physician who worked in Gaza for more than 10 years, he reported recently during the war of Gaza that the fundamental reason for the ill health of the population in Gaza is, of course, the siege and the bombing. For that, he was uh, uh, not allowed to come back to, to come back to, uh, to this land. He was deported, and uh, maybe he needs solidarity also from professionals. Uh, this statement was developed by some Israeli colleagues and myself about ending the occupation of Palestine for the well-being of the Palestinians and the Israeli nations. Uh, and it was signed by many mental health workers uh, in the world. And this is another statement that was developed by Mark Bruton, a community psychologist from London, and signed by community psychologists in different parts of the world, where uh, maybe they have uh, more sensitivity to, uh, uh, to understanding the context and the uh, the effect of the context on, on the well-being of people. Can Israeli professionals help? <coughs> yes. If not, but, but not when they are loyal to the dream of Zionism, whose implications are contradictory of Palestinians' human rights. They don't go together. It's not a win-win situation. The more Israelis breathe under occupation, the more we choke. So they don't go together. And addressing the psychology of Palestinian necessitates acknowledging their narrative, being in solidarity with their plight for liberation, and working for the deconstruction of the occupation that has resulted in their oppression. Otherwise, you will be doing good deeds. But good doing is about humanizing the occupation and rendering it more acceptable. It's not about deconstructing the occupation. It's not about ending the occupation. And without ending the occupation, there will be, this is a big contradiction and big harm for the Palestinian survival. <coughs> and I end with some words from uh, Samih al Qasim. And I read it in Arabic because I heard this morning that there are some people who, uh, uh, the wife of the first presenter wanted to do some things in Arabic. Okay, so Samir al Qasim says, "Rubama taslubuni akhir shibbin min turabi, rubama tutaimu al-sijni shababi, rubama tastu ala mirati jaddi min athafin wa awan wa khawabi, rubama tahriku ashari wa kutbi, rubama tutaimu lahmi lilkilabi, rubama tupki ala qariyatina kabusa rubi, ya adu wa shams, lakin dan usawin, wa ila akhir nabdin fi aruki sa'uqa. Thank you very much for listening.
part of uh, Samant's talk uh, reminded me of this little song. The question is, are the Africans in Africa prepared for independence? Do they have enough delinquents <coughs> among their juvenile descendants? Can they fill their air with smog enough, their rivers with pollutions? Are their citizens evolved enough for mental institutions? Are they smart enough to know enough to regulate their taxes? so the poor can pay the rich to keep the poor flat on their axis? Do they know how to destroy what they produce for their in enjoyment, or employ enough machines to keep employees from employment? Have the natives the intelligence, the native wisdom, or the dexterity to establish atom bases for the base of their prosperity? In essence, we ha we, have we morally the right to even plan to let the backward nations join the Brotherhood of Man. Uh, who wrote it? It's called An African Song. I learned it from the Chad Mitchell Trio many years ago. I'll find the, I'll find the author. Um, our next uh, speaker is the reason uh, that we are here today. Uh, Uri Hadal, professor uh, uh, at the, and a psychotherapist at, uh, and a professor at uh, Tel Aviv University. I guess you'll have to justify that now. Um, and the, um, uh, a very active part of Psychoactive. Uh, and he will talk on the notion of part resistance. Self-reflective, 
to make choices and to take responsibility. As a subject, a person or a group try to know who they are and what they want to achieve. As a subject, we make choices that suit our idea of who we are, and we try to be responsible, namely, to cohere with our choices. <coughs> Being a subject is not a simple thing. We constantly encounter conditions that suppress, repress, and oppress our ability to be subjects. Life conditions often create obstacles that make it difficult to know who we are, to choose accordingly, and to be consistent in our choices. Both psychoanalysis and post-colonial theory address conditions in which subjecthood is injured, conditions in which subjects are unable to take their position. However, there is a difference between them in terms of the source of the injury. While in psychoanalysis the injury refers to the individual, in post-colonial theory the injury, the injury refers to an identity group, be it ethnic or otherwise. In psychoanalysis, the aim is to liberate the subject from repression, from being unaware of what is going on inside his or her soul, while in post-colonial theory, uh, a liberation is about, uh, the liberation of the subject is about liberating the subject from the oppressor and the state of oppression. Of oppression. Right. On the face of it, these are very distinct entities. In repression, the oppressing agency is internal. The ego, the superego, while in post-colonial theory, the oppressor is clearly external and alien to the subject, namely the colonizer or the occupier. Or the, or the occupier. Both psychoanalysis and post-colonial theory are concerned with the question of how to rehabilitate the ability to be a subject after it is injured, how to, to restore identity, to restore mentalization and responsibility when these are injured by restrictions and attacks on the subject's ability to position themselves. In psychoanalysis, the injury usually occurs because of the behavior of a parental figure of somebody else who is involved in a significant way with the life of the subject. These behaviors may not allow the subject to exercise the subject. In postcolonial theory, the injury occurs by a subjugating force that restricts the freedoms of the subject group and deprives them of some of their rights and riches. The context of, the, of rehabilitation from injury is where we meet the concept of resistance. Resistance defines practices which, on the face of it, reflect the polarity between psychoanalytic and postcolonial colonial fields of action. This is so even though both, appear to, uh, both approaches examine the relevant issues from a similar perspective, namely that of being able to maintain identity, make choices, and exercise responsibility. The difference between the two fields manifests in the simple fact that resistance in psychoanalysis is construed as an obstacle to rehabilitation, while in post-colonial theory, it functions as a necessary condition for it. It appears as if overcoming oppression, resistance to occupation, and overcoming repression, psychoanalytic psychotherapy, deploy different processes and strategies. This would seem to erase the possibility that the notion of resistance refers to similar processes in the rehabilitation of being a subject. Freud, however, already spoke about resistance not only as internal state, but also, and perhaps even mainly, as actions aimed at the therapist and the therapeutic process, insofar as they function as a stage on which the relations between consciousness and unconsciousness are played out. So, for instance, in the radical approach to interpretation that Freud proposed as part of the topographical model, his early model, uh, it is only the resistances that the therapist interprets. In this approach, 
the unconscious material does not take a personal role <coughs> vis-a-vis the subject, but is constant in, in constant activity in an attempt to connect with reality. The unconscious one might say rubbles and bubbles. It is always active. And the reason, <coughs> the reason it does not reach consciousness is the same as the one due to which the material becomes unconscious to begin with, namely the threat that it poses to the self's imaginary unity. In this, Fro- uh, in this Freudian approach, what the therapist needs to do for analysis <coughs> of the head is to interpret the resistance and so help remove the obstacles that get in the way of the unconscious materials right to consciousness. In Freud's own words, finally, there has evolved the consistent technique used today in which the analyst gives up the attempt to bring a particular moment, to, uh, moment or problem into focus. He contents himself with studying whatever is for the time being on the surface of the patient's mind. And he employs the art of interpretation mainly for the purpose of recognizing the resistances which appear there and making them conscious to the patient. From this, there results a new sort of division of labor. The doctor uncovers the resistances which are unknown to the patient when these have been gotten better off. The patient often relates the forgotten situations and connections without any difficulty. The aim of these different techniques has, of course, remained the same. Descriptively speaking, this is all for Freud, not me. Descriptively speaking, it is to fill the gaps in memory. Dynamically speaking, it is to overcome resistances due to repression. This interventive minimalism is very elegant. Because minimalism because you only interpret the resistances. More crucial, but, and more crucial to the present context, it presents an approach in which resistance is the therapist's main accomplice. Resistance is what the therapist is after. And without it, therapy is impossible. So there is a certain chance, there is a flip over in how resistance functions for Freud. First, it's an obstacle. But without it, one cannot do it. This is why Freud believes psychotics cannot be treated by means of this method, psychoanalysis, because, uh, because in psychosis, uh, there is a collapse of self. Uh, the collapse of self results in the absence of resistance. And when this is the case, the service main accomplice <coughs> resistance is missing. What I wish to stress here is that the interpretation of resistance is the Archimedean point on which analysis rests in Freudian theory. If that is the case, then resistance cannot be total. What, uh, it's as if resistance splits between how it functions as an obstacle and how it functions as an aid to analysis. One can always split resistance by interpreting it and use the force that it offers in order to free the patient from repression and other oppressive processes. By by stressing the constructive qualities of resistance, I'm not, of course, trying to say that the negative definition of resistance is lacking in interest. Not at all. Resistance is always defined through the negation of the entity which it directs itself. The therapist the occupier. Resistance forms itself by way of negation with reference to the abusing authority. This negative core means that resistance cannot be total because it is always defined by its, by its object. Destroy the object and you have destroyed the resistant subject as well. So what we have here is that resistance not only does not make a distance between the subject and the object of resistance, but actually connects between them. By avoiding totality, like in analytical factors and some theories, resistance constitutes, from the outset, the very grounding for therapeutic progress, exactly that progress that allows the subject to escape from abuse and injury. The logic of the negativity of resistance, as it features in therapy, resembles the logic of negativity in the various philosophical approaches that originated in Hegel. In all of these, negativity marks the sites that possess the potential for development, sites where the subject's relative weakness 
suggests a potential program. <coughs> wherever the subject is positive and full, wherever she is comfortable, there is a certain degree of subjective density, a kind of developmental satiation, which leaves neither room nor motivation for movement, for changes of position. I think this is how how uh, degeneration uh, of society comes about. So there is a certain fullness, there is no lack, there is no resistance, there is uh, 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 degeneration of, of, of culture. There, where the subject feels defined by the other, an experience which always carries a sense of injury, there one finds room and motivation for development. This is a place that resistance marks in the subject's field, together with the subject's wish to change and her ability to perhaps do so. Ability and wish may resemble each other in this respect. It is in the context of this logic that Freud's view of analysis and psychosis needs to be understood, where there is no resistance like in psychosis, the field of the subject is homogeneous, undifferentiated, Flat, so that it is impossible to establish a potential zone for development in the patient's life. One which presents itself as injury on the one hand, but as enabling on the other. In the case of psychosis, either everything is equally injured, or the realm of injury is so devastated that it offers no hope for potential restoration or rehabilitation. Now, if the negativity that resistance marks forms the foundation for development uh, in functional individuals as well, then there is no reason to perceive of injurious offending other as a total negativity. This is the basic truth about, not, about the not too good mother or the bad enough mother, where parental injuries are not catastrophic and do not destroy the subject's ability to rehabilitate, a level of destruction which psychiatric language calls psychosis, injuries from the analytical point of view are not simply bad. Parents' failures stake out the areas of possible development of children's subjectivity. <coughs> this is a fundamentally analytical statement. Morally speaking, injury is injury, and therapy, as I argued in my recent book, must recognize it as such if it is not to err into, our, into the trap of our intellectiveness. But analytical theory is essentially committed to symmetrization in situations marked by injury. In that sense, I echo here what uh, Jessica Benjamin said earlier. It is committed to the possibility of, of escaping the irreconcilable split that injury defines on each of its sides, victim and perpetrator. The dialectic of resistance and the way it constitutes the offending other as relative or relatively negative as an anchor for rehabilitation has always been and remains the cornerstone of analytic clinic. Resistance, in that sense, is always about resistance. For the general understanding of group as well as for post-colonial theory, my construal of resistance has far-reaching implications where it comes to understanding the role of the aggressor or the oppressor or the occupier. The latter has a role in the rehabilitation of subjecthood in the occupier. This is not to say that the oppressor <coughs> inaugurates the progress of the oppressed, as colonial rhetoric would have it, starting with the Israeli and through to Golda Meir. But part resistance defines the possibility of progress and thus turns evil into relative evil, into the object of symmetrization. The first thing it implies is that uh, any rhetoric that presents the oppressor as the object of absolute negation always offends against truth, while also blocking certain options for resistance. Construal of the oppressor as absolute negativity first causes a reduction in the pair view of resistance. A second implication, as Ian has often stressed, is that the uh, work of resistance will have to be carried out with the cooperation of significant circles within the oppressor society. The very possibility of resistance inaugurates the oppressor as not entirely negative, and hence as a potential partner in the practices of liberation. 
A similar idea is developed by Stephen Frosch as well in his book, Psychoanalysis Outside the Clinic. This is a recurrent phenomenon in all anti-colonial struggle, though it is not sufficiently reflect, reflected for a variety of reasons on the level of the political manifesto. By implication, in order to sustain itself over long time frames, resistance should have modest aims in post-colonial struggle, defining the aim of resistance as the destruction of the offender in sociologically erroneous. This has been recognized in analytic theory from the outset through the very recognition that therapy is possible, but postcolonial theory is still undecided on this issue. It too must recognize the validity of path resistance in order to mobilize wider circles into the resistance circle, as well as to maintain the hope that after the institution of political agreement, violence will be seriously reduced. The idea of part resistance has consequences for the understanding of a number of issues concerning the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. First, we must define and understand the subject of resistance. What or who is resisting the resisting subject? How can we define it? Is it a people, a Palestinian people, by virtue of living in certain territories, in sticking with them? This idea is suggested in the concept of sumud, Sticking with the land, holding firm, continuing to live your life despite all difficulties. Israel <coughs> often intentionally make life difficult for Pal Palestinians in order to force them to move. There is a point to the idea that simply going on living already constitutes resistance, or at least part resistance. The subject of resistance can also be individual in individual engaged engage in particular activities such as armed struggle, performing acts against the occupied, participating in demonstrations, legal activities, or cultural acts that clarify and mobilize others, educational acts, for instance. These are often, if not always, <coughs> organized activities, so the act of individuals are pursued in the context of a group. I just want to uh, mention the uh, case of, the, of youth against settlement in Hebron in Khalid, for example, uh, it is, I think, particularly striking because activities also involve classes in various fields of knowledge, not only resistance and the split between uh, actions against the, uh, the, the, the occupier and uh, giving classes in art, crafts, and English and language. It's the kind of split that I, that I think resistance builds upon. Uh, they also uh, include self-help uh, among group uh, members in terms of ordinary needs. This particular organization preaches non-violence and has uh, practiced it in uh, the most admirable way. They also often work with, Israeli, with Israelis, especially from the Ayush, but also from breaking the silence. For me, they are the most uh, remarkable example of part resistance. And one of the leaders, Badi Adwek, wanted to be here with us, but could not get a permit to enter Israel. The second issue of uh, part resistance in the context of occupation concerns the way we identify the object of resistance, the enemy, the occupier. We have a few possibilities here, the first of which is clearly over-inclusive and coheres with the concept of total resistance, rather than with the concept that I'm trying to develop here. In this overarching view, the object is seen as all Jewish Israelis, without distinction among them. This view tends to obliterate the individuality of the object and regards persons by their group identity. Clearly, suicide bombers hold this view implicitly, if not explicitly, but often explicitly, and there is a very strong dialectic that ties the total obliteration of the object with the total obliteration of the self. In the dialectic of subject formation, we need the other to validate our existence. A total destruction of the other means the destruction of self as well on one level or another. Another <coughs> common object of Palestinian resistance, and one that coheres with the notion of part resistance, is the Israeli army, bases, individuals, in all of their activities, and in the occupied, ter uh, in the occupied ter territory. This was the emergent view of small paramilitary groups of armed struggle that flourished in the West Bank after the invasion of the cities by the Israeli army in 2002, in Operation Defensive Shield. As far as I am aware, none of this is still active, which is very significant in its implication for the prospects of armed resistance. 
in the territory. Because of the distribution of military power, armed Palestinian resistance is very limited and short-living. This perspective of the uh, object of resistance may also serve, serve to examine the practices of the BDS movement, the uh, boycott movement, which calls for boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israeli institutions and against collaborative struggle between Palestinians and Israelis. BDS can be examined from the prism of uh, defining its object. Is it everything that is Jewish Israeli, or is it directed against institutions that have no have not announced the object, uh, objection to the occupation. The definition of the object is crucial to uh, realizing the potential effectiveness of BDS. I will turn to this matter shortly, but I do not have time to discuss it at any length. Finally, there is the issue of means. Violence has often been seen as the only way to resist a violent occupier. In fact, violence has been said by Karl Marx to be the prime means of fighting against oppression. In his, in, in his words, violence is the midwife of history. No system will give away its power of its own will, so violence is the only way to liberate oppressed groups. However, the lesson of all anti-colonial <coughs> struggles indicate, indicates that violence breeds violence. Political arrangements do not end the violence. They only re-channel it in other directions. With this is cross conditions of colonial, colonial occupation, as well as in all Marxist-inspired revolutions. This insight has made the wide circle of political Palestinian resistance object to violent practices. I, I want to uh, finish with a comment on BDS, uh, on, on the boycott movement, and, and they offer a clear alternative to violence and should be respected as such, irrespective of their pragmatics. However, the idea of part resistance, as we have seen above, is very simple. Make distinctions, be specific. In the long run, resistance is more effective the more it is able to define its object in precise and specific <coughs> ways. I want to illustrate this in the story of this very conference. Our story is not special in any way and does not offer a specially important insight. I only discuss it uh, uh, for the chance of clarifying my ideas and because it is kind of uh, just out of the oven. In the Jewish-Israeli context, this conference of ours is also part of, uh, of resisting the occupation. Not a very dramatic resistance, not maybe a landmark at all, and yet a clear voice against the reigning occupying spirits. A part resistance. An interesting, an interesting case of partiality in the working of resistance comes out strongly in the, run, in the run up for today's event. Originally, as you know, the conference was due to be held at the University, but we changed the venue to the Cinematheque here because it was communicated to us that some Palestinian organizations were going to call upon Palestinians to boycott the event. Since the participation of, of every interested Palestinian was important for us, we decided to move the location from the university. Now, what is the meaning of an event of resistance being staged in, the government, in a government Israeli institution? The BDS stance is that this totally annihilates the nature of the event as resistance, because the governance semiotics is that of the hosting institution. If it's a university, it's the logic of the university. If it's uh, Nebe Shalom, it's the uh, Wahat al-Salam, then it's the logic of Wahat al-Salam. However, the idea of bad resistance should allow even staunch supporters of BDS to reap the fruits of the particularity of the event. In our case, it seems to me, the message of the event, of the words and ideas that it propagates, will not annul because of the housing semiotics, university versus cinematic versus some other place. Part of it is due to the fact that while the university is an institution, is, is party to the occupying semiotics, many voices within it carry contrary messages. They are of resisting nature. The voicing of Gaza narratives, as we do here today, the amplification that derives from international participation in the conference, this ensure, to my mind, that the public echo of what we do here will be of clearly resisting nature, irrespective of the nature of the host. The idea of part resistance 
could have allowed us to maintain the tension between the nature of the institution and the nature of the message. If we were to do this in Tel Aviv University, it would not have been a shattering event, but it could have been a step in the right direction. Thank you. Lunchtime. Uh, please be back at, 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 like at two thirty. Oh no 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 two two. It is now one fifteen. What time is it now? One fifteen. Yes. Uh, please be back if you can at two thirty. You can't be back at two thirty. We'll start when nothing more back. Try to be back in time.